Champion, an officer at the Seattle Position Chamber, Local 76, 493 for 20 years. Eight years as the Secretary Treasurer. Now I am the President for the past 12 years. We are here today to present a report commissioned by the local. And I brought with us our researcher and our musicians. And uh, we'll go around the table and introduce ourselves. Maybe would you like to start? Hi, uh, yes. Yeah, so my name is Megan Brown. I'm the author of the report. I have a Master's of Public Policy at Hopkins University. And I'm currently a PhD candidate in geography at the University of Washington. Hi, my name is Joey uh, Walbaum. And uh, I'm a singer, songwriter, pianist. Uh, I've also worked at the college level teaching choirs and such. And I'm involved uh, heavily in about six different ensembles in the Seattle area. My name is Francis Brennan. I'm a busker. I, uh, I play banjo and I work with a bunch of other instruments. And I have a one man band and uh, play with other bands around Seattle. My name is Steve Rosetta. I am a music promoter and producer uh, at some venues you may recognize Triple Door, Bakes Place, Nectar, Chop Suey, etc. My name is Nate Alcohol. Uh, I am a upright jazz bassist. Um, I am the leader of uh, Fair Trade Music Seattle, and I am also a Cornish Quality Arts graduate. Um, before we launch right into uh, the report, it would be helpful to set some context. Mm -hmm. um, what, how, how you came to decide this was an important thing to do. Thank you. One of the initiatives of the local has been to um, work with freelance club musicians to figure out, with their help, how we can begin to improve the wages and working conditions of those musicians. A piece of that work has been to commission this report. We felt it was important to survey the city of Seattle and actually find out what is going on um, in the industry. There are two parts to this report. The first part is based on governmental information. And the second part, which is extremely fascinating, is based on a survey of 124 musicians. These are primarily musicians that are working in the club industry. In our business, we have freelance musicians. Um, should I move forward with the public? OK, thank you. Um, I'm just going to read a few um, notes into the record um, that will give some background on the report. This report looks at the impact of the music, music industry on Seattle's economy. This industry includes not only musicians, but those, in those that are dependent on musicians for music. That would be like the multiplier effect. Those impacted may work in manufacturing, wholesale or retail sales, video, film, and music publishing, education, from grade school through graduate school, as well as private instruction. They may work in the theater, dance, and music venues, ranging from symphony, opera, and ballet to live theater, festivals, and services. We have found that the music industry has a significant impact on our area's economy. Direct employment in the industry provides over 16,000 jobs, <clears throat> creating 1.8 billion annual direct footprint. The indirect impact, the circulation throughout our economy, makes the total economic contribution 4.3 billion per year, supporting over 30,000 jobs. We were astonished to find out how big of an impact musicians and the music business has on the Seattle economy. <clears throat> While the industry is, is growing in our area, the musicians at the core of the industry are not sharing in that growth. Since the city's analysis of the economic impact in 2008, we have added almost 5,500 new music-related jobs with an increase of 6 million in direct economic output and 1.7 million in total impact. Despite this overall growth of about 50% in seven years, in this same period, payroll has gone up only 12%, and payroll per employee has actually decreased by 25%. So you did a comparison of your study to the 2008 study? Yes, we did. That's right, that's for sure. <clears throat> Although we like to think <clears throat> me, of Seattle as a music city, we need to do more to make music a viable and sustainable source of income. Our survey of 124 working musicians found widespread problems with unfair treatment by venues, a lack of clarity on working conditions, and inadequate pay. Although a typical working musician earns 
the majority of his or her income through music, that musician earns only about $15,000 per year from music-related income. We have three principal recommendations that have come out of our report. The first, making the city admissions tax more supportive of smaller venues. And we've already substantially, that has already been substantially adopted by the council. Although more work is necessary to provide adequate transparency and accountability on income at the door. The second is that the city limit or eliminate black updates for musicians, which Joey will um, address in a few minutes. Finally, the city needs to work with Fair Trade Music and our union, musicians and venue owners to promote standard written performance agreements and ensure both a fair relationship and clear understandings regarding pay and working conditions. Much of the work done in these clubs is on cash basis under the table, and there's no, um, no written agreements, so we think that that would really improve the working conditions for these musicians. And Thank so we do have the, the, the um, voluntary program that you guys helped develop yes. through Fair trade music. Yes. And that's a voluntary program by which um, clubs identify themselves as members, and in doing so, they agree to certain standards, one of which is providing musicians with a contract. Um, to what extent is that being used currently? I think I'll pass that question to one of our other uh, musicians. Uh, Nate, would you like to address that? Sure. Uh, well, we um, have. Uh, heard that our contract has been adopted by a couple of the venues. Um, a number of them have come up when they found out that we were circulating the document, uh, like, oh wow, we've been looking for something like this that we can use as a template for the acts that are coming through. I don't fortunately know how many musicians are taking advantage of this, but the response from the venues about having something that has been vetted by the performers themselves has been very positive. I hope that answers your question. So it's just a little hard to have hard numbers on how many contracts have been have been exchanged. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, the way I envisioned this rolling out, and it's probably at odds with what your plan was, but um, was that clubs that were members um, and agreed to the standards would get some sort of a visible recognition. Um, so that would be a way of both identifying those clubs that were adopting good standards, as well as being able to get a sense of uh, identifying for the, for the public, Absolutely. Um, as well as being able to get a sense of um, to what scale people are agreeing to do this voluntarily versus um, looking at another non-voluntary approach to do the same thing. We, we are pleased to report that we've begun distributing um, window cows that would speak to a club that has signed on to these agreements and uh, we have about 25 venues around the town that are eat with a pretty equal representation from all the neighborhoods in the city. Um, got out with uh, Councilmember O'Brien to uh, several venues in, in his district and uh, you should keep an eye out for those and uh, hopefully we'll be, those will be seen with increasing frequency as this campaign continues to go forward. And let's think about whether or not there are ways that the city can yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And so, so for, we went to a few clubs and put stickers up on the windows. Um, is it still too early? Are, are, are most of the shows coming through there with written contracts? Is, the extra, I mean, is that the expectation, or is it still kind of evolving? In some I would definitely say it's still evolving. Um, as much uh, education that is needed within musicians about what what's out there to protect them as education is needed in the, in the public and then also with the venues that are hiring musicians are the best ways to go about doing things. But the, you know, as our, as our program goes forward, we're really pleased to announce that all of, all of our, our findings and our documents that we're sharing are being met with a lot of enthusiasm and it's just about trying to get all of the, all the different elements to sort of line up together so that they can all start happening at the same time. And we do feel like that's not so far away. Also, one of the incentives for the venues to sign up was that they would be prominently placed on their great music uh, website. So there's literally a map that's been put together, and it lists those clubs that are under the Fair Trade banner. 
I, I would just like to add that um, this is a, a major cultural shift in the way business has been done in these venues. It's going to take time, um, but we are um, committed to moving this program forward. Joey, would you like to uh, speak for a moment? Um, sure. Uh, the main uh, thing I asked me to speak about was the blackout dates. Uh, and there's two major issues that seem to be happening uh, as I've spoken to uh, many musicians about this uh, over the last while. <laughs> um, there's an issue with the, the length of time before and after a particular performance that they do not allow in, uh, musicians to perform within, this, within a certain area. Um, and for example, one particular local venue um, does a deal where people came out perform one whole month before and one whole month after the time they performing within the entire Seattle area. I mean, if a musician is working locally, that's stopping them from being able to work, you know, within, within the city. Um, generally, uh, feeling I've gotten is about two weeks is like, yeah, that, feels, that feels like, you know, like fair, you know, like, because we, we want to make sure people are attending, you know, so we don't want to oversaturate and understand that whole side of it all. But the two week thing, or two months are in both direction. Uh, for me personally, uh, I've, had to, I've lost three gigs if I would have taken one gig. Do any cities set policy in this area? Research? I, I don't know what the other cities are doing. Can answer the question. Is, is it, um, so I've heard about that about um, festivals, yeah. um, but what you're talking about is more about clubs that actually do it. Than well, I, 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 yeah, yes, I want to talk about both because that is on the local, the extreme local level, um, as far as like what's immediately affecting uh, a lot of musicians uh, that aren't necessarily at the level of being in a festival quite yet. Um, and if they are at the level of being in a festival, then you have the issue of. There's one particular festival um, that I could cite, but I'm not going to say what it is, but um, it does have a 300 mile radius. That means, that means if you're in Spokane, all the way out that far, you, you can't, you can't, you have to go that far to be able to perform within like two months, three months of, I mean, that's a lot, that's a long ways to go. First off, you lose $300 just trying to get out that far. You know, with your, with your ensemble. Um, I can um, maybe speak a little bit to what other cities have done to address this. Um, I'm definitely not an expert on this topic, but what I have kind of been led to believe is that uh, other states have addressed this through the non compete laws that they've passed. Um, and what I'm currently understanding is that Washington is a little behind in some of the old regards. Um, we've been working, Fair Trade Music North, with uh, Derek Stafford to try to bring our perspective into the, the blackout date, which is one of the things that Modder spoke to. Um, and we feel that perhaps by addressing, addressing this issue on a larger state level, we will we probably be able to pick up a lot of musicians that are experiencing that first link to pick up, which always testifying to as well. And um, we're really hoping that there is there can be some some ground made there. Sorry, to derail you there, but it's, it's okay. Uh, Francis, would you like to speak? Oh uh, yeah, I have a statement about about busking in Seattle. It's, uh, it goes like this. <laughs> my name's Francis Brown. I play banjo, and Irish whistle, and several other instruments. I've studied music all my life, including two years at Berklee College in Boston. For the last seven years, I've made my living primarily from busking the street performance in Seattle and also all over North America. And I have found that simply setting up in public places and giving my music away in hopes of receiving tips is a better business model than being exploited by bars and clubs in Seattle. There are many others like me taking their music directly to the people rather than dealing with the so-called music industry, and there are also many gigging musicians who regularly perform as busters. And we're most visible at Pink Place Market, but we may be found in public places all over Seattle. And, um, Busking is permitted by the Seattle Municipal Code, not to mention the First Amendment. And I've never been treated by a criminal by the, for, by the SPD, but I've received such treatment in other cities, and most recently by Southern Transit security officers for busking at light rail stations, even on the street outside of the Beacon Hill station, where I was repeatedly told that Southern Transit stations are private property. 
And though many have not yet opened these stations, are vital to Seattle buskers because they are public spaces with terrific acoustics, a constant flow of people, and of course, no rainy days. The amount of rain Seattle experiences in the winter sends many buskers packing for New Orleans or other such places. With the coming of the light rail, I see a potential for a new golden age of Seattle underground music. And I hope the council will agree that this is the buskers' right to use the public transit facilities, and otherwise our absence will continue to be glaringly obvious as already is to any visitors who have heard Seattle's reputation as a music town. Um, can I follow up question on that? Please. So I, um, I think as recently as last year, witnessed a few great concerts in the subways of New York as I was moving from one place to the next. What, what, how does that work in other jurisdictions? Um, this is a little bit new for San Francisco, and we obviously have the yeah. downtown tunnel, but we're going to have a couple of stations in Capitol Hill University District. Do, do folks typically sign up or do folks just show up? Or, I mean, how do you manage Pike Place Market? Uh, Pike Place Market has a, a permit system and has locations where, where performers are, are supposed to be, and that's because they have such a, a volume of, uh -huh. of performers there, and that's because they have such a volume of people. Um, the, uh, let's see, other cities have permit systems for the subway, and some don't. And I think in New York they have a system where uh, you can reserve a spot and uh, sign up and get a permit, but then there's other spots where people can use freely. Okay. And so, so we don't really, I haven't seen most of these stations yet, so I don't really know, you know, for one thing, if my act is even going to do well down there, but I think they definitely need to be open for, you know, someone who's act might. This is a great spot down there. Yeah, so. the Beacon Hill Tunnel especially has just heavenly acoustics. You play flute down there, and it just echoes down the tunnels in the back. It's beautiful. That's great. I have something that I think we can follow up on, um, kind of create some openings for some conversations with Soundcast about um, their thinking um, about limitations and the opportunities. And I think for, um, uh, I believe Soundcast has announced an opening date yet. The station. They said first quarter. I imagine that's going to be in the first quarter. Um, but I also believe that they are, um, you know, actively looking to promote the grand opening with, um, you know, bringing. Yeah, they, 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 they've hired buskers before. My concern is that, uh, you know, that it's, that it's free for, for people to use whether they've been hired or not. Right. You know. Well, yeah, I was just say that this, the, they think this is a good thing in the opening weekend. Yeah. Then, yeah, exactly. How about it just happens organically? Forever. That would be great. That's, that's what I would think. Okay. okay. Well, we can have a conversation. And, um, Councilmember Rob Johnson is um, city council member who's on the Center Transit Board right now. So we're going to have a conversation with him and see if that's something we can talk about. Great. The other thing you might want to think about doing is going um, to on, on your report and also to look for support on your individual recommendations when talking to the police um, commission and the police commission. Um, that is a body of people that is tasked with advising the city on um, policy issues. And um, I think it would be really useful in um, trying to identify ways that we can begin to have uh, a broader conversation um, with the music community, uh, with the industry, about how to move some of these ideas forward. Um, I think the, the folks on the commission are um, whether or not they're representing musicians or clubs are tasked um, with moving forward. And um, I think it would be really helpful in helping us sort of chart a path. We do, um, our Vice President, Joan Sandler, is on the Music Commission, and Kate Becker and Joan are here today, um, and uh, we are working closely with them. So. Uh, Steve, do you have any remarks to share? Sure. Um, I'm one of the few people in fair trade music that doesn't play an instrument other than I played clarinet very badly when I was young. But I happen to love music. I've been doing music promotion and uh, production for roughly the last 10 years. Before that, I worked at Microsoft for about 10 years and uh, in more of a, in a business function. So what I kind of have brought uh, into this experience with music production promotion is more of a business perspective, less of a you know, less of a musician perspective. But I like musicians very much. I like working with them, and uh, that attracted me to fair trade music. So I've had generally I've had really good experiences with venues I worked with in Seattle. Um, probably three times in the last ten years, I've had a negative experience where uh, 
maybe somebody didn't want to pay what they should. And most recently, about a year and a half ago, that happened to me. I had a really good band play at a local venue. Uh, had a very explicit contract agreed to in writing, in email, uh, stating this is the door fee, will be paid the number of attendees times the door fee, no deductions unless otherwise agreed, blah, blah, blah. Well, at the end, they decided to make some deductions. And I, and they, they, they wanted me to sign the sheet at the end of the night. Uh, and I said, sure, under the condition that I can address this. When I addressed it with the folks at the venue, they basically said, yeah, sorry, we missed that in your email, but you're not going to get paid. It was only $170. For me, uh, it's a principal issue. Uh, because they're basically saying, I, I'm, not, I'm going to short these musicians because I can. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth. Quite frankly, it felt like bullying. I'm a pretty good negotiator from my years at Microsoft, and it was hard for me. I did collect that money by threatening to take them to collections and treating them as if they didn't pay their utilities, and they eventually did pay. Uh, and that's how I was led into fair trade music, is to get sort of advice as I was in, in the midst of all this. And I realized musicians, if, it's, if it was hard for me, it's got to be incredibly hard for a musician who's mainly focused on their craft to have these kinds of discussions. In fact, you know, in most cases, I've, I've talked to musicians and they, you know, they just have to eat the law, sometimes not get paid at all, uh, if they want to play that venue. Um, so that's sort of the, the promoter perspective. On the one hand, it's great to hear that you're experiencing the last 10 years of three or so instances of that. Mm -hmm. um, um, I imagine that there are other folks that have it higher Oh, higher levels where it happens more often. And, you know, we just had a conversation earlier in this committee about um, our Office of Labor Standards, and it's um, wage theft is something that um, you know, we struggle with for folks that are actually employees, but we know that wage theft happens for any kind of contractors and other folks too, and I think it's, it's unacceptable anywhere. Um, and, um, you know, I, I really am excited about fair trade music to help elevate that and help. Um, as, as not being a musician, but being a consumer of music, to, to recognize and realize that that actually is happening. And the brand really helps me um, think more proactively, just like we do about fair trade chocolate or fair trade coffee, about, hey, I, I want to make sure that my consumer dollars are going to support folks that are playing by the rules that I expect in our city and that I want my dollars to go to. And um, I think the hope is that the folks that may be playing that game um, because that's just the way they think you're supposed to do it in business. And for us to say, no, actually, not in this thing, that's not tolerated at all. And there are probably folks that think that this is a great way to do business and they should be ostracized and they kind of should go somewhere else if they don't want to play that. Yep. Well, I, uh, I asked the Microsoft Office of Labor Standards to be in the report. Um, if you have any questions, yes. Do you have, um, does the report cover? Uh, sort of a, uh, what you feel like might be a representation of the kinds of abuses that employees face, um, or is that something that might be um, another another analysis that you could do? Because I think it's always really helpful in promoting public policy to be able to um, identify that, that there is a problem beyond the very important anecdotes and stories that people tell. I yeah, so I think that the report is a good initial shot of talking to working musicians about some of the abuses that they face. I think there's definitely room for more, uh, more in-depth analysis. Um, I think that exploring this issue further is essential to understanding working conditions in the music industry, and I would be in support of that. I believe in the report there are um, some uh, statements by musicians of abuses that have occurred to them. Um, well, back, excuse me, back to um, the Black Hat dates. Um, the city has a role to play in one of the festivals here in Seattle, Overshoot, and um, I, just, I, I guess I encourage us to think about as a city um, how we can, you know, uh, we, we want the festival to be successful, obviously, um, as I think everyone does. Um, but making sure that we're being very thoughtful and appropriate on what those black half days are when we negotiate with whoever, um, I don't know exactly what their relationship is, but there's someone that runs that festival that's on city grounds. And so um, I don't know if there are typically different standards for 
musicians that are traveling here versus local musicians? Or? Yeah, yeah the, the main concern with Blackout Dates is to make it where when a band comes in that has a draw, they don't play at a major festival and then play at a local venue to sell it out and make more money. And they, it's, 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 it's so that makes logical business sense. Right, but it's also a practice that exists that was really put in place back in the 70s and 80s. And because I mean, music was a little bit different back then. And mm -hmm. There's a, you know, <laughs> and, right? You know, there's a, there's a very raw thing that was happening at that time. But it's 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 just old thought. It doesn't apply anymore. I think a lot of there's um, a distinction also to be made between a professional musician that is on a level where he's touring nationally, he or she is touring nationally, and then. A local musician, while just as professional as any touring musician, is staying in one region to earn that living. And the issue that I think is that these blackout dates, they don't just make a distinction between those two types of individuals. It's a blanket statement that says you can't work in this region for this amount of time. That doesn't affect an artist that's touring on a national scale that's only going to be in Seattle for 48 hours. The next stop's in San Francisco, which is well outside of any, any blackout date. That's, that's a, a non-issue for an artist like that. But for someone like Joey, who lives in, you know, in the U District, be, to be told that you can't make a living for a, a month, two months, right. in this large radius and is absolutely it's three or four months. It's, it's, and, yeah, so you finally get invited to be in a festival to step and up, and if you accept it, you take yeah. a huge financial. Yeah, you. Generally, the pay for festivals for local musicians is low to nothing. Right. It's tr it's treated as a marketing opportunity. So yeah. it's you know it's sort of a double you know it doubles the problem where you you're, you're not going to make any money doing this and you're blocked out. Yeah. One thing I think might be helpful is um, if we could um, get some assistance from um, the Office of Film and Music and maybe collecting some examples of different non-compete clauses. And we can take a look at uh, which ones have some um, harm on artists and which ones you think are more acceptable and actually make sense mm -hmm. according to sort of a shared understanding um, of, of what will work for the clubs or what will work for your ability to earn a living. Um, I think some of that maybe information gathering, if possible, would help Again, in a path. I, I like to think of um, this committee time as a, a place to actually work on issues, not just hear from you, but to sort of identify what the next steps we can take in order to assist them. I think we definitely, as a, a community, feel that there is a, a very practical middle ground, um, but there does need to be a little bit of a give and take. You know, if, if a, an employer has the right to put a, a non compete clause in a contract, then I think, as on the other side of that, the artist should have a right to perhaps see a better paper trail for the money that's attached to that gig. If, if it's just a local club saying you can't work for this amount of days, we should be able to ask, well, then what's the financial implication of that going to be? How much does your business earn? Realistically, can I see those receipts to, so I can educate myself and make an informed decision as a small business owner? I think some increased uh, oversight from the city in that regard would really help in learning what businesses are asking of artists. And oversight, you mean as it relates to um, the, the ticket sales. collection? The ticket sales and the collection of that revenue. Well, we appreciate your um, interest in problem solving, and we will uh, definitely continue to work with you on that. Um, thank you for the time today. And are there any final remarks? I think that wraps it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, we'll call this meeting to a close. Join me. Yeah, that's what you say. I forgot the space going. Make sure the heads are blocked from each other. Nice. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now, are there reporters here? Does anybody have a question? Yes. And well, I want to hear. Come out. Is, is there any TV doing this, too, or is it just me? I, I'm Josh Kearns from Cairo. Right? <coughs> Steve. Okay. This is Josh from Cairo. Who would you like to speak to, Josh? Well, you'll see. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 believe it or not, I... <laughs> Go for it. 
So you're the uh, now you're the, the author of the study, correct? Or uh, the, I am the president of the local. And so who actually did commission? Who actually did the, the study? The local commissioned it. Local seventy six four nine. So what was what was the point of the study? The point of the study is to actually see what is happening in the music industry in Seattle. There's a lot of anecdotal information that is shared amongst musicians, club owners, and the public. We felt it was important to actually look at government statistics to see who's employed, what kind of work they're doing, and also talk directly to the working musicians to find out what the working conditions are like. When we have that information, then we can begin to identify issues and begin to problem solve. Our goal is to improve the wages and working conditions and the lives of working musicians. As somebody who has played in bands since I was in high school and I've played every club in town for the most part, I, I mean, I recognize everything you've described, but I don't see a real solution in there because the second you say, for example, non-competes or higher wages or standards, they're just not going to book my band. So we're, how do we get from the obvious problem, which is that none of us make much money doing this, to actually having somebody willing to pay? Given how many just bands we have, yeah. yeah. Tell me, you're, you're Joey, is that right? My name is Nate Ombro. Oh, your name? Who's Joey? I am Joey. Okay. Um, we're actually hoping that uh, if what you described does turn out to be ultimately true, which we don't believe to be true, because as we found 25 venues that have signed on to our uh, fair trade music uh, relationship standards, um, they are already willing to work with, you know, work with musicians to make sure that the the deal is, a, is fair and, and treats both parties fairly. But if ultimately a solution isn't able to be met, you know, just between the two parties, that's, we really feel that a statewide solution to the non-compete issue would make it so that it doesn't put the onus on individual bands to try and do this by themselves. The state can step in and say, hey, Mr. Club owner, Mr. and Mrs. Club owner, you just can't do that. It, it will, won't put any, any Kind of yeah. uh, negative light on any individual band if the state, if the state says to the entire community, this is a business practice that we're just not going to accept anymore. Well, now you're talking just not on non competes, which again I agree. I've been been blacked on both sides many times and worked with many festivals, but just wages in general. I mean, I played the tractor sold out on Friday night and walked out of there with you know 50 bucks for the band. How do we get to a point where you can actually get the clubs to agree to cough up a little bit more? I mean, I've done pay to play. I've you know. How do we get past I can, that? I, yeah. I can weigh in on that. Um, part of fair trade music is a, a large component is education. Um, most uh, constituents, most consumers do not understand the dynamics that occur between a club and a musician. And as we move the campaign forward, we hope to educate the consumers so that they understand that how vital the music industry is to this community and they will rise up and support the musicians that are working. This is a long-time solution. This is going to be a long-term solution because what we're asking for is a change in the way business is done. We're asking for a change in the way people perceive music. It's not a hobby. It's not for fun. It is a way of life and people need to be able to feed their families, afford housing, afford medical care, and like I say, it's going to be a long-term solution. Excellent. That's yeah. Please. This, this is, as you say, my name's Paul Bigman. I'm an organizer with the union. And um, as Mata was just stressing, this is something that is a workers' rights issue and not just an artistic issue. And we'd like to give an opportunity for Nicole Grant, who's Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, I'm not going to go down. I want to stick with this closely. Well, it's, it's a labor issue. We'd like, we'd like to give her a chance to say something about why this is important to workers in general. Well, well, she can certainly talk to me. I'm interested. <laughs> and, and, and also Councilmember Herbold uh, talking about why this is an important issue for the city. And I'll get there next. Thank you. Yeah. Did you get a report? Yes, I did. Thank okay. you. So real, realistically, when we've got 50 bands out there that are willing to play every night of the week, and a club can simply just say, okay, you don't want to do it, fine. You don't want to do a blackout, fine. How do we, is it, do we have to get to a union thing, which is still, you know, I've never felt any leverage, and I'm about 20 years older than you, so I've been down this road. Yeah, look, we have, like I said, we have a large number of clubs that are, I'd like to interrupt you. Yeah, there's a large number of clubs that are, 
adhering to the standards that we're asking. And what we've found is that that's enough clubs to support a lot of people. And sticking to the venues that give you a better deal than the ones that don't, you know, that's a big part of this. Is we're really trying to educate, as Monarchs are trying to educate the community about which venues, which businesses are the, are the ones that are acting responsibly and the ones that are worthy of the community support. Um, we're really feeling like if we can be a tool to show the general public that information, um, that there will be enough patrons that will want to support those venues that will then in turn support the musicians fairly. The, the venues that don't, that do what you propose, line up 50 bands and say, do you want it, do you want it, do you want it, they'll become irrelevant. That would be great. I, Steve, I mean, you as a promoter. Yeah, I mean. I mean, is that, is that doable? Can we, no, that's fine. I mean, this is. I want to give Joey a chance to talk to you. This, is, this is the up. practical <laughs> side of it. You know, Absolutely there, there, there is ideal, been, idealism and there is We've been dealing realism. with people saying that for the three years we've been doing fair trade music, and the reality is is that you don't need to play in every club in town sure. to have a successful go of it in a city the size of Seattle. And just by knowing who the fair players are, you can really, really do a lot better. Um, as the principal leader of this fair trade music, what convinced me that it was a safe thing to get involved with and to maybe stick my neck out a little bit was I looked at who I was employed by and realized that they were going to be the fair players that we were going to start identifying. As a jazz musician, I have that luxury to be able to work with some really, really great club owners that understand what musicians go through and just realizing that, hey, I'm already in a really good position to do this work and to advocate and to show other musicians this really safe network of club owners to work with where you don't have to worry about them pitting one band against the other. There's really only, you know, I wouldn't say that's everybody in town that does what you were suggesting, takes the 50 clubs, 50 bands, and, and just lines them up and see who will take. Well, but if you're playing jazz, are you playing the high dive, the Comet, the Tractor, sure. any of those places? Sure, okay. sure. I, I think as a we all promoter, make a little, yeah, this, this town isn't big enough for you to not do that, so. Yeah. As a promoter, whenever, every show I've done in the last 10 years, I have a written agreement before the show. And I know exactly what the terms are. Generally, that works really well. And the clubs appreciate it, the band appreciates it. Uh, and what we're trying to do is also to empower the individual musicians to understand the necessity of a contract, not just, gee, I wonder what we made at the end of the year. So they can have a clear expectation that both the club and the, and the musician are on the same page. So part of it is bringing the musicians up to speed on you know, the business side of what they're doing, which is negotiating a contract. Yeah. And they're, they aren't very complicated, really. No. You know? No, it says you're going to get 100 bucks or whatever. Or, yeah, or it's a percentage you know, of the yeah. door. And, and uh, so that's, that's part of the issues that we're having, though, is like, like, for instance, the percentage of the doors, they don't keep track of how many people are actually coming through the door. I've watched them, and they're not, they're not clicking the things like they need to be clicking. And when you're done, you don't have any piece of paper that says how many people actually came through. And they're going, well, you got a percentage of this, or you got all the door, but I'm giving, getting handed $300 after a whole show going, how many split this among all the people? And I know there was more people. Than, than what $300, according to this, is supposed to get me. Um, the, other, the other issue that, that I think we're trying to work towards is just creating a, a better sense of um, quality control on both sides. You know, happy musicians make happy music, happy venues, you know, it, it all works together. You know, the, the venues themselves create an environment that the musicians can thrive in, then the musicians can get up there and take that energy and put it out towards the crowd, which then it, it makes people feel good, you know, and that's the whole, that's why we're doing this, is to try and create awareness, try and get messages across, trying to, you know, grow um, uh, the way that we think as a community, uh, musicians pro provide all this stuff. On top of that, we're also trying to encourage other music, other people that have not stepped into the music world to take a chance and step into the world. But if they see us up there kind of disgruntled, you know, that's not very encouraging. And it's a fact that music is one of the, is not one of, but the only thing, the only uh, craft that actually stimulates the entire mind. And that's scientific fact, you know, so people actually literally get smarter just by trying music. And that's why we're out there. We're trying to make people smarter, you know, and here it is being pushed down and repressed. 
to another one when it should be completely the other way. And then on top of that, you also have the East Coast versus West Coast. If you go up and down the East Coast, the, the, the pay is a lot more consistent. You know, they've got a lot more time to develop all that. We're, we're still kind of babies, and we're still learning from that over there. But I've talked, I've talked to a lot of musicians that come from the East Coast, and they say straight up that, that Seattle just, it does not, it does not operate on the same fair standards as far as you know pays and contracts and, and just just the, the standard of operation. You know? So we're trying to we're trying to level it out, and not only for us, but also for all the other cities that are that are out there that are having struggles with this as well. Can I can I add to that? Yeah. Who are you? Step into my musician. Jeez. <laughs> Who are you? Uh, I'm Ed Mays, and I'm in the. Uh, Fair trade music also, I'm a drummer. And I have been playing uh, since 1971. And in Seattle and all other places in the country. And that's what I wanted to add. Is that uh, you know there are places like Austin, you know, and uh, uh, Nashville. I was down south man, and even Denver. But uh, especially those first two that, that uh, actually you know uh, you know have music as a part of their their business model. And they uh, uh, have gone really far to actually. You know, uh, study the music business and really promote musicians, right? If you go to Austin, you'll see uh, music in banks and so shopping centers. And of course, in certain areas, there is just one club after another. But you could argue the city does that already. They put on lunchtime programs and all They do that a little bit. But the thing is, that Seattle is a big city. And uh, compared to other cities, there's no music business here. You know, because when I went down to Houston, you know, I didn't have a problem. I wanted a gig every single uh, week, you know. If I didn't have a gig by Friday, I would have a gig. And I was always looking for the traveling gigs, the hotel gigs, and, you know, and I toured all over the country from there. It doesn't really happen here, you know. You might go to uh, Bend, Oregon or something, you know. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an attitude. People down south really support live music. So, so what we're trying to do is like change the attitude of people, you know, to support live music, you know, and uh, that's something that the city could help with, and uh, uh, you know, the different business associations, you know, could help with that a lot. Uh, to, you know, maybe change that attitude. Okay. Thank you guys very Thank much. You. I mean, believe me, I've been down, you know, I've been fighting this fight for, well, I'm 50. I've been doing it since I was 16 in LA. I lived in Austin, and I, so I, I hear you on all of this. I just also see the practicality, the reality, which is there's a shitload of bands here. And there are, you know, the venues, the key venues, whether, well, I'm not even to get into like the new model scenes, but, you know, there's just so many clubs that have the upper hand. How do we gain some of that power back without them just saying tough shit? You know, we don't need you. I think that's kind of where fair trade is coming in, where, you know, the, the venues have the power in so much is that the, the musicians aren't all on the same page. If you can get everybody on the same page and act collectively, then, you know, look at, you know, venues like the Tractor, the High Dive, the Tractor, blah, blah, blah. I mean, their whole business is the musician. If they didn't have a musician, people would not come and spend money in that bar. So if access to the talent pool uh, kind of required better behavior, and those clubs I'm fine with, by the way, but, uh, uh, you know, things are different. Makes any sense. The other thing is that fair trade. We're trying to shine a light on the good clubs or the clubs that have signed on with us and that we think are treating musicians fairly. And when you do that, you know, hopefully over time, someone's going to go, "Hey, well, how come you guys aren't on that fair trade list?" You know, and you. Uh, Again, yeah, just shine a light. Yeah, well, I think you guys have touched on, and to me, the most resonant thing of all this stuff is that fact that the whole notion of fair trade, like the fair trade coffee, we've seen people shift that they're willing to spend more for fair trade products, that, that there are consumers that will choose based on value. And that's never been articulated as a value proposition before when it comes to music. It's, mm -hmm. well, I want to go to Chop Suey or whatever, just because it's Friday night, and it's like Kevin Owens where you always went. And you don't give a shit at all about that, you know, that element of it. I think it's, that's a huge 
I, I think that's, that's, yeah, that's part of what we're doing too, though, is also trying to bring back the community awareness of what's happening locally. Because uh, honestly, you go around and you ask a lot of people, like, where do you go to find local artists? You know, we're, we're, we're bombarded with Hollywood, we're bombarded with, with you know, our, our TV advertisements and all that stuff telling us of all these artists that aren't here. You know, we need to spotlight locally that allow people to have a chance to fall in love with the people that are right here in their backyard that are, that are putting out music just as high quality as what's coming out of LA and such. Um, it's here, it, it exists here in, in Seattle.